Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm really honored to be here in Australia. First time for me in this country, even though I lived for three years in New Zealand while I was studying my, my PhD. Uh, so thank you to Toby's estate for the invitation. And um, I, I hope it's valuable for you to be here tonight. Um, so uh, as, as Laurie said, my name is Mario Fernandez. I'm, I'm the Coffee Quality Institute uh, Technical Director. And um, first of all, very briefly, I would like to share with you what, what we do at the Coffee Quality Institute. We are, we are a non-for-profit organization that has been working for 20 years already in improving the, the coffee quality and thus also improving the livelihoods of those who produce it. And we work internationally um, in development projects across the world, se several producing countries. Um, and you might uh, know us mostly for our Q grader program, uh, but we now also have other education programs such as the Q processing program. And what many people don't know is that we work uh, at origin countries uh, by training producers and also uh, facilitating their access to higher, higher value markets. Um, so what we will be discussing tonight, and um, I believe we have 30 minutes, so if somebody can uh, let me know if, if I am going over time so that I, I okay. Um, and also, if, if any of you has a question along the way, just don't, don't be afraid to ask. We will also open the floor for questions at the end, but don't, don't forget your question. Um, so we'll, we'll be first of all talking a little bit about what we call processing methods in, in coffee, post-harvest processing methods and how they affect uh, the, or how they impact the final flavor. And then we will delve deeply into technical materials, namely two of them. One of them is the role of microbes in, in coffee processing. And the second one is how the specific flavor of naturals, specifically the fruity and whiny flavor that is characteristic some, to some naturals is developed. And uh, if we have time at, at the end, I, will, I, will, I would like to share with you a little bit of what we are doing at CQI with our new cube processing program. So, um, first of all, what do we mean by coffee processing? Coffee in, in nature is, is a fresh fruit. That's why we call it the, the coffee cherry, because it truly resembles a cherry. And uh, it needs to be converted, that fresh fruit needs to be converted to that dry seed that we know as the, as the coffee green bean. And there are many ways how we can do this process, how we can, how we can transition from the fresh fruit all the way to, to the dry green bean. And anything that we do, any, any little change that we do might in turn affect the flavor uh, in, in very dramatic or very subtle ways. Uh, that's one of the reasons why now as, as coffee flavor has become more and more important in, in the third wave of, of coffee and as, as the coffee shops and the consumers are focusing more and more on coffee flavor, uh, processing has also become more important as a, as a way to impact flavor. So here we have uh, the two main examples. Uh, on, on the left, you have the, the cherries being dried as, as the whole fruit. That's what we usually call the natural coffee, natural process. And on the right-hand side, you, you see the parchment, meaning that the, the pulp has been taken away from, from the seed. The mucilage that covers the parchment has been 
fermented and washed away, and and the bean is just dried with with a layer of the parchment surrounding it. Now these are the two, let's say, most famous processing methods: natural and washed. And I'm going to be referring to to them um, along the talk. So. Maybe you have heard about naturals for a long time, or maybe it's a new word for you, uh, because in, in, in many consuming countries, uh, the focus on processing methods and how they impact flavor it has been a recent phenomenon. But, uh, but maybe if you ask people in the industry what they think about naturals and what flavor they show, they will probably s say it's, there's berries, or there is grapes, or there is, or, or there they they're wild and funky, yeah. And uh, and so here we have a, a number of quotes from 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 the industry, dif different people from the industry stating what they think about the the flavor of naturals. So for some people in the industry, the flavor of naturals is very positive because it, it's fruity and it's different to other processing methods. For some of the industry members, uh, fruitiness is on the verge of being fermented and that shouldn't be allowed in a coffee. So the, the opinions about the flavor of naturals tend to be polarized amongst the industry members. And then what what do ind prominent industry members tend to say about the washed coffee when compared to the naturals, where they're more citric, more floral, and um, cleaner? And these these are um, we could say these are generalizations or stereotypes that the industry holds about uh, how the coffee coming from a certain method should taste like, but um, it's not necessarily true in every case. One, one thing is to say that, that it's an idea that is held by industry member and a very different thing is to say it's, it's a fact or it's, it's a general, it's a fact in every case. So this one here, this, this, is, this is not an opinion by an industry member, this is an actual study, a sensory study from 2016 um, comparing um, natural coffees versus washed coffees from uh, specific origins and, and, and the, well they didn't study they didn't study many samples but from the few samples that they study one thing that they got clear is that naturals were slightly more full-bodied and a thicker in mouthfeel and they tend to be more fruity, whereas the wash coffee have have an overall uh, lower intensity. They're more drying and they're less complex than what naturals tend to be. Uh, this is another study from um, from Mexico. Uh, the way how I will explain this. Uh, Imagine there's a, a, a universe of flavors. If, if you want, there's a city of, of flavors in which each neighborhood has different flavor characteristics. And so different coffees live in each neighborhood. Um, natural coffees, this is an exclusive neighborhood for natural coffees. Uh, only naturals can live here. And, and this neighborhood shows uh, fruitiness and winey characteristics, and it's really, really difficult from coffees coming from other processing uh, methods to show those characteristics because these are ex almost exclusive to naturals. In a similar way, we have a neighborhood which tends to be more exclusive to washed, and there are a few washed coffees that live there, for example, showing fruity, floral, maybe spicy notes, and it's very difficult for naturals or honeys to approach that neighborhood or that expression. And we also have a large tract of the city which is very diverse. Uh, those are what we call common flavors. And think, think about chocolate 
chocolatey notes, for example. You can have a natural coffee that is very chocolatey, you can have a washed coffee that is very chocolatey, or you can have a honey coffee that is very chocolatey. The reason for that is that chocolate is one of those common flavors. It's not one of those exclusive neighborhoods, and, and, and therefore it can be shown by any given processing method. Uh, so what we are saying here is that it's not true that natural coffees are whiny. Why? Because there are many natural coffees out there that live in those common flavors and maybe they will not be whiny, maybe they will be chocolatey, for example. What is true is to say that um, though that whiny character or very fruity character is almost ex exclusive to naturals and that it's very difficult for coffees from, an, uh, from other processing methods to show those characters. And why, why does that happen? So um, we know that flavor is our interpretation of the chemical composition of a food item and, and, and and especially the flavor notes like fruity or caramelly or chocolatey, they are expressed by what we call um, flavor compounds. And so what is happening here is that different um, processing methods uh, imply different mechanisms within the bean that somehow change the chemical composition of of the bean, and that's why they end up tasting different. And I will just mention one, one, one key example that you may be familiar with. Uh, you may have heard that the most important um, reaction during coffee roasting in terms of, of flavor formation is the Maillard reaction. And the Maillard reaction takes off from the combination of uh, single amino acids and, and reducing sugars. So if you have a different ingredients, you will end up with a different outcome in terms of flavor or sugar, brown, sugar browning flavor. And what is happening here is that both free amino acids and, and um, glucose and fructose, which are the main ingredients of the Maillard reaction, have, um, are different based on the processing method that was used. For example, in the case of naturals, glutamic acid, which is one um, amino acid, is converted to GABA, whereas in the case of uh, washed coffee, the, gluco the glu glucose and the fructose, which are single sugars, also taking, taking part in the Maillard reaction. They're almost depleted during the processing. So if you have different ingredients to start with, the outcoming flavor will be different. And uh, it's similar case with the other compounds too. So why, why is this happening? Why do why do we have different flavor compounds depending on each processing method? Uh, so scientists have debated this over, over many years. Some, some scientists say, oh, what, what is going on is that um, some compounds enter the bean from the pulp or from the mucilage and therefore they, 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 they remain there and become precursors. Some scientists say, no, that's nonsense. Um, compounds cannot enter the bean, but surely some compounds ex exit the bean and, and they get um, uh, leached into the water when you ferment the coffee, for example. And um, so some, some people think that things enter the bean, some people thought that things exited the bean, and some people finally said, no, ag actually m what is happening is that things are changing within the bean due to fermentation or due to germination. And the scientists fought uh, over these theories for, for, for a while, uh, passionately defending their point of view. But uh, now we know that uh, chances are the three things are happening at once, which shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us. 
because as you might know, co coffee is one of the most complex food products known to humankind. And um, in complex products such as wine and coffee and chocolate and tea, uh, complex things happen from the, big, from the start all the way to the consumption phase. So there, there were also some scientists saying that the differences in, in flavor were surely due to microbes acting on the beans during processing. Uh, so there were different kinds of fermentation on, on the bean and, and those different bugs produce different compounds that would affect the flavor. Uh, and that, that's also true, but what these researchers were also forgetting was that um, the, the bean is a living entity, and especially when it's, when it's fresh. When, 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 when the coffee bean is still a part of a fresh fruit, it's, uh, its metabolism is very active and it's, it's, it's very susceptible to germinating. And that's actually one of the things that happens wi within, within the beans. Um, sometimes, depending on the processing method that we use, we are actually triggering a germination reaction in, in the bean. That, and what happens when, when a baby plant starts germinating. The first thing that happens is that it starts taking nutrients from the rest of the seed to boost its growth. And uh, that's, if you think about it, that's, that may be one of the reasons why the sugar and the glucose are depleted in the case of washed coffees, because those are the most readily available nutrients for the baby plant, glucose and fructose. Um, so, th in this graph, without, without getting too technical, we are comparing what, what happens in the case of washed coffee on the left and uh, natural coffee on the right in terms of the germination mechanism. And, and so, they were using different indicators to measure the degree of the germination reaction uh, from from this from the seed, and what they found is that um, when when you pulp the fruit and you start the fermentation of washed coffees, that that's a huge stress to the seed, and the seed takes it as a signal of now or never. It's it's now or never that I should sprout. And, and they, they, they start um, an intense germination reaction that is quickly shut down by the drying process. So as we, as we take the moisture out of the parchment, we quickly shut down that germination process. That's the reason why, why we don't eat a little sprouted um, coffee bean. And in the case of the naturals, it's very different. We just uh, pick the cherries and we slowly dry them and there is never this huge amount of stress to the fruit that triggers the germination reaction and, and, and therefore uh, a lot of um, reactions in the beans and, uh, are, are much milder compared to what happens in the case of the washed coffees. So um, we, we're now going to switch to this other topic, which is ex examining the role of m microbes during processing. And um, I if you think about it, this is a very trendy topic in, in the industry nowadays. There is people claiming they do anaerobic fermentation or a triple fermentation or champagne yeast fermentation and, and many different kinds of fermentation and one of the claims is that, that that's directly impacting the, the flavor character um, and um, therefore there's a lot of focus in using for example starters like uh, champagne yeast for example and onto, onto the 
coffee fermentation as opposed to the wild fermentation that we usually have. So let's think a little bit about what that means in terms of um, scientific research. Uh, first of all, when you compare coffee fermentation to the fermentation that you find in other uh, food products such as bread or wine or, or sauerkraut or kimchi or, or prosciutto or cheese, you name them, uh, in, in most of them you favor the growth of one specific kind of microbe and you try to eliminate all the other competing microbes so that your, your microbe is the one that gets the chance to, to work on the, on the product. So for example, in the case of wine, you, you basically just have the wine yeast growing in the wine and you get rid of the majority of competitors. Whereas in the case of coffee, we don't do that. It's a, it's a spontaneous fermentation, meaning that we have whatever arrived onto that coffee coming from the cherry, living on the cherry peel, or the water that you used for pulping the coffee, or maybe living on the walls of the fermentation vat. Uh, all those can be sources of, of different microbes, meaning that we effectively have a, a zoo, uh, a zoo in that fermentation vat or in on that natural coffee of different populations. Uh, we, 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 not, we, just, we not just have bacteria, we also have yeast, we also have molds, and, uh, and we have whatever landed there naturally, and chances are what the microbes that are being um, found in uh, Costa Rican coffee are going to be different to what we find in a Mexican coffee. Actually, that, that's a proven fact from a study. The microbes on the ferment in the fermentation vat are different depending on each origin. And uh, one theory is that uh, part of the uniqueness of each terroir comes from their specific um, blend of microbes. And, and another thing in the case of coffee is that that zoo is actually, it, it's not static, it's a succession in, in which the predominant populations are changing a long time depending on different controlling factors. For example, in the case of washed coffee, as you ferment the wash with the washed coffee in the vat, uh, it becomes more and more acidic and the pH drops more and more and as, as the pH drops more and more then the, the microbial populations that can live in that medium are different. So the, the population is controlled by acidity, right? Whereas in the case of naturals what's happening is that we are drying the cherries more and more and as the cherries become more and more dry the, the available moisture for different populations becomes the li limiting factor and only the population that can grow and multiply at drier, at drier conditions are the ones that keep surviving as you dry it. So w you start up with one mix of uh, microbes and as you ferment uh, it, it keeps changing dynamically and that adds up to the whole complexity of the process. Um, so we have two graphs here. One is from washed coffee and this one is from natural coffee showing how different um, microbial populations become predominant at different times during the fermentation because of what I just explained. The, the shift in pH in the case of washed coffee or the shift in water activity in the case of natural coffee. So we, we, know, we know a little about the effect of all these uh, populations, especially w when it comes to their effect in the final flavor. But here are a few of the things that the scientists have been able to, to find out. One of the things is that in the case of 
washed coffee, lactic, lactic bacteria can play an important role in the development of acidity because of the lactic acid that they produce, for example. Um, in the case of natural coffees, we, we are going to talk about natural coffees further, uh, but the production of alcohol by the yeast can be taking a key role in the formation of fruitiness and wininess in, in natural. So what happens when we use a starter? What happens when we, let's say, add uh, champagne yeast to the coffee and uh, basically kill all the other populations by outnumbering them? So we, we could get positive results or we could get negative results depending on what we took up from, right? Sometimes if, if we are if we are lucky, we, we can be getting better scoring coffees, but if we are not lucky, maybe we are actually effectively getting rid of the complexity uh, brought by those diverse populations. So I'm, I'm going to zip through these slides. There, there's, there's several studies that have proven that um, Adding microbial starters can be beneficial to acidity or to flavor in specific, very specific conditions of um, farm or variety or microbe strain. Um, however, there's also several studies that prove the contrary, uh, meaning that Coffee being such a complex product, you could not expect to have the same results over and over. Actually, I always say that coffee always proves me wrong. Uh, and, and, and that's true. Uh, you always think something is going to happen when you change something and, and the final outcome is oftentimes the opposite of what you expected. And that's always the case in the case of coffee. So. Um, what we are saying is that there, there, there are certainly certain uh, specific cases in which the use of starters improves the flavor or the final cupping score or, or the improves the control, um, the controllable characteristic of the fermentation. But there's also other cases in which you uh, lose complexity or maybe you lose some desirable um, notes, and what what is actually more worrying to me is that the use of starters reduces biodiversity. That already happened in the case of the wine industry. Uh, when when people sample the wild yeast living in the wild in the vineyards they find that the, the native yeasts have been replaced by the wine yeast applied at, at the winery level. Um, so humankind has effectively destroyed the, the biodiversity of, of let's, let's say, grapes yeast in nature. And um, if, if we start using starters for cacao or for coffee, we, we risk uh, also reducing the biodiversity of the microbes that are currently native to the coffee lands and that may be um, bringing some specific characteristics to, to the coffee. Or even if they don't bring specific characteristics to the coffee, they still have the right to existence. Uh, we, we all worry when we hear that uh, a uh, cute animal like koala bear or panda or pandas are in danger of extinction, but we really don't um, realize that microbes can also be in danger by human actions. And it also reduces the biodiversity within the, within the fermentation bed itself, because it's no longer that rich zoo that we talked about, but now it has become more like a homogeneous um, single strain fermentation. 
So um, now allow me to tell you a little bit more ab about natural coffees. Um, I told you that I, I lived in New Zealand for three years while I did my PhD and in, in that time I was studying uh, how the fruity and winy flavor of natural coffee is developed during during the pr process. So I'm going to share with you some of those results. So first of all, as, as we explained, there is no, there is not a single uh, style or character of natural coffee. Of course, m most people expect their natural coffees to be red fruity or maybe tropical fruity, but the truth is that uh, natural coffees can range all the way from being non-fruity whatsoever, all the way to being fermented, right? So uh, these are all different styles. We are not saying that one of them is better than the other. Each of them is going to find uh, their own market, the most the, the market that best values that, that particular style. For example, you can find many naturals that are non-fruity. You can, you can experience their, their sugar browning notes such as chocolate or caramel, but, but it's really hard to find any fruitiness in there. Uh, then you have another style that starts having some fruitiness and we call that a dry fruity character. What, what do we mean by dry fruit? We, we mean um, sultanas or prunes or dry fig or tamarind. And these, this character can also be found in honeys. For example, it's, it can be characteristic to some black honey coffees. Whereas non-fruity character can be shared with any other kind of uh, processing, be it washed or honey. Then as, as, we, as we get further to the right, we start having styles that are now exclusive to naturals. First we have the, the fresh fruity styles, such as red fruity. What do we mean by red fruity? Strawberry, blueberry, cherry, black cherry, and all those berries. And, or tropical fruity, what do we mean by tropical fruity? Banana, pineapple, mango, and so on and so forth. But they're still fresh, fresh fruits. And then as you get further into the right, you get fermented notes, which may be winy, like, uh, like red wine, or uh, cognac, uh, bourbon, whiskey, uh, or fungal. Meaning, it, this not necessarily means moldy or musty, but um, uh, for example, it could be leather-like. So there could be still some desirable notes, even as far as here. Um, so the further you go into the right, the, the more reduced the market for that profile. You, you may find markets that love whiny natural coffee, that get crazy about it, and that would pay high prices for it, but they, they are few markets compared to, to, to the extent of people who would accept a non-fruity coffee because that's a more conventional kind of coffee. That's what we are meaning here. So as you, as you move into the left, it becomes more... Um, easy to accept by the majority of markets. Um, and these, this axis is also correlated to the, to, to the intensity of the fermentation and, and therefore to, to the rate of drying. If you dry the natural coffee very quickly, chances are you will get a non-fruity natural, mostly with, with um, sugar browning notes, for example. Okay, so in the case of naturals, there's also a microbial succession, which is controlled by 
by the water activity. When, when the coffee cherry is very fresh and the water activity is very high, the bacteria are, are happy. They have all the moisture that they need and they outnumber all the other populations. So you, you, get, you get an intense bacterial fermentation at the beginning of, of drying. But as you dry uh, the naturals and, and you get rid of water, then the bacteria can not longer survive or, rep or reproduce. And then the yeast become predominant, right? And as you keep drying in, into the last stages of, of drying, then now not even yeast can survive, but all the, the molds can still reproduce. So the last part of the curve is where, where the molds become predominant. This is important because this, this can be similar to um, roasting curve. You know, in, in a roasting curve, depending on how much you linger on each part of the curve, you are going to have a different effect on the flavor outcome. And this, this is the same case here. Uh, imagine that you, um, you carry out the first section, the bacterial part, very quickly, and then you linger the drying at the, at the yeast fermentation section, and then you dry it very quickly again during the last section. That means that you are ma maximizing the chances for the yeast to reproduce and be the predominant uh, population in, in that coffee's fermentation. Uh, but you could do it, you could do it in different sections too you could you could do it in in order to favor bacteria or to favor the molds and so on and so forth having a different final outcome in terms of flavor um, and it's not difficult to do um, we we did it at the phd research simply by changing the width of the layer and the frequency of turning over uh, um, of the cherries during, during drying and also playing a little bit with the surface of drying, for example, using the concrete patio versus the African tables. And this slide is very technical. This is the actual conclusion of the PhD research, but I will, I will try to uh, explain it um, and summarize it for you. So this is the slide that, that explains the different pathways that you can have when you are making a natural coffee in terms of their final outcome in flavor. So let's say you always start by having amino acids and sugars. If you dry very quickly, you are going to keep your amino acids and sugars. You are going to you are going to keep them unchanged, and therefore, when you roast that coffee, what is going to happen is that they are going to go into the Maillard reaction, and you are going to get uh, sugar browning character. That would that an example that would be the example of the uh, non-fruity natural which has been dried quickly. But if some of the amino acids are degraded during the process, uh, you can get these compounds here, the short chain branch aldehydes, alcohol and acids, which may have a, a fruity character, like a baked apple character, or a cognac character, or bourbon character. And what happens to the sugars if, if they are fermented? especially by yeast, they become alcohol, and then that alcohol can become acetic acid, and that would be the source of the uh, whiny acidity of many naturals. But the trick is when these compounds here get combined with the alcohol, then powerful fruity tasting compounds are produced, namely fruity esters with uh, strawberry and blueberry flavor. And these are very powerful compounds. You, you just need a little bit of them 
to have a fruity natural, meaning that you can keep the majority of your sugars and amino acids to, to bring about a chocolatey character and a little of them uh, turning into fruity esters so that you can have a chocolatey fruity character, something like a dark chocolate filled with a blueberry jam, <laughs> which is my ideal of a natural coffee, right? <laughs> right. Um, so let, let me tell you a little bit about CQI's Q processing program. And um, well, yes, this is an advertising, but keep in mind that we are a non-for-profit organization. <laughs> so, and, and you, you may be acquainted with the Q grader program, which was started more than 10 years ago by, by CQI. And it has really helped change the way how people describe coffees across the world and it has really helped uh, facilitate the communication between producers and, and buyers ac across the world. Um, so it, it has helped vertically and horizontally to ease the communication ab about the way we talk about coffees. Um, and um, as I said in the beginning, the, the industry's focus on processing has changed. Um, only a few years ago, nobody ever talked about processing at the, at the consuming countries. Very few baristas or roasters were even aware about the importance of processing in the flavor of the coffee they were purchasing because that was not traceable. They just bought coffee without knowing what kind of process was applied to it. But as, as we enter the third wave of coffee and, and, and consumers demand more traceability about what has happened to their beans and, and they want to know more about uh, how that relates to the flavor they are experiencing, the industry in the consuming countries is becoming aware that processing is indeed important and, um, and, and, and the industry is more and more interested in, let's say, innovative processing methods or, or at the very least differentiating processing methods. And that has gotten the producers also terribly interested in learning more about processing methods, especially with, with, with the goal of fetching a higher price in mind. Um, however, out of all the millions, without exaggeration, out of all the millions of people processing coffee, I, I can assure you that none of them attended coffee processing school. Nobody ever took coffee processing classes as a formal course. All of, all of us, including me, learned from our parents or our peers or wherever we could by trial and error and um, ruining a large number of coffee batches in the way. Uh, if you compare that to what happens in the case of wine, in the case of wine, you have the figure of the winemaker, which is normally a graduate um, student from an enology school or a, or a winemaking school. And, and the degree of professionalism in, in, in winemaking is, is incredible. So that, that's, that was our inspiration. Um, why, why cannot we uh, improve the, the level of professionalization amongst the people who process coffee? And so, this is a new logo. Huh. The differently, differently to the Q grader program, in the case of the Q processing program, we have three different levels. The generalist level is what we are going to be teaching this weekend here in, in Sydney, and it's targeted uh, precisely to those uh, professionals, live what I call urban coffee professionals, that um, have little experience with farming or processing, but want to know more about all those obscure processing terms and how they can use 
that knowledge to, to better sell those coffees to, to their customers. So the, the generalist level is, is really very basic and we, we learn about uh, the basis of coffee processing and um, what each processing method implies and we also hopefully get rid of a lot of myths that have been reproduced within the industry from mouth to mouth. Then we, we have the level two, which we call the professional, Q processing professional. This one is targeted to people actually um, working with coffee processing. And um, since none of us went to processing school, it's a little bit of what, of the theory that we would have learned at processing school. What, what is the uh, objective? of processing coffee, what are the different technologies available, what are the good practices versus the bad practices, how can a quality control be carried out during coffee processing, what variables can you measure, how can you record them, and so on and so forth. And also we have um, the participants um, produce different processing methods hands-on. and the expert level, this is what we envision as the equivalent of the winemaker. This is really like um, more, this is closer to um, university diploma in terms of length and depth. So people need to be certified as level two already and they need to go through one semester online in which they actually study a lot of uh, papers and articles about coffee processing before coming to the farm and, and get hands-on with different processing experiments. And after that they go back to their, to their farms of origin and, and um, they need to submit a project in which they actually impacted the flavor of coffee through processing in a, in a specific way. Hopefully the way they were expecting, but coffee always proves you wrong. Uh, here's a little video about it. Buenos días a todos. A nombre del Coffee Quality Institute, les quiero dar la bienvenida. Q Greater came along and it was extremely necessary and important uh, at the time that it came along. First, for providing a way for growers to find out the quality of their coffee. The other huge thing that the Q Greater program did was that it trained a group of cuppers and provided for communication throughout the world. So a grower could communicate with a co-op, who could communicate with an importer, exporter, all the way through to the end consumer and talk about coffee scores and talk, talk about sensory profiles. And through that communication, a lot of great coffees were produced that otherwise would have been lost in, in general lots. The Q processing program builds on that and that how can we increase this communication? Processing is one of the best ways for a grower to aggregate value to their product. It's very difficult for a grower to pull up all their crops and replant a new cultivar. It's different for them to sell their farm at a lower altitude and move to a higher altitude. But a grower can change the way that they're processing the coffee to provide a consistent product to the end consumer. Entonces, aquí hay un cilindro únicamente, ¿verdad? Que está girando con una polea y este canal, cuando si quieren alguien se puede parar acá y vea aquí internamente, ahí están los canales donde cada cereza y el grupo de cerezas se mete en el canal. So nowadays more and more producers are asked by buyers to start playing and, and experimenting with processes. And that has opened a, a, a lot of interest from, again, from producers to start, you know, uh, using their coffees and processing their coffees different ways uh, so that you're able to come up with a portfolio of products. 
more information. And one of the reasons that I'm interested in this as an anthropologist and as a researcher is that there's there's actually not a whole lot of data on processing. And what there is is hard to access or it's hard to bring to a different context. Uh, it's very specific to a particular place or a particular kind of machinery or, or set of resources that are not necessarily available. There's three different levels to the Q processing program. The first level of the course, it's geared towards uh, baristas, roasters, or just anyone who loves coffee, so anybody, anybody can attend. The second level of the course is geared towards those that are, have experience with processing. The third level of the course is the expert level of the course. Somebody who passes that level, the third level of the course will have understood the state of the art of processing and then contribute to that. For me, the processing course is uh, one of the main factors that is, is a lack, is a big gap in the whole value chain, in the processing, and is, I think, one of the most important elements in the whole quality equation. That's it from my part.